Welcome to the panel on innovative CPG, plant-based products for a health, healthier world. My name is Elizabeth Lanchowski Holmes and I am a first year MBA student at the Tuck School of Business. I'm excited to introduce our panelists. Natalie Sierra, who will moderate the panel, is a director of Purple Carrots Garden Incubator, which serves as an investor incubator and launch pad for emerging plant-based brands. She previously worked as, in investment banking at Whipstitch Capital, focused in the healthy living consumer products industry and asset management at Wellington Management. She holds an MBA from the Tuck School of Business and a BA in public policy in Spanish from Syracuse. Cessna Mack is an investor at Power Plant Ventures, an early stage growth VC focused on supporting founders seeking to deliver better nutrition in more sustainable and ethical ways. She previously worked as a management consultant at EY Parthenon and a first grade teacher at Teach for America. She holds an MBA from the Wharton School and a BA in psychology from Harvard. Daniel Bernstein is the co-founder of We Are the New Farmers, a company that grows and harvests fresh spirulina in an indoor farm in Brooklyn. Daniel previously worked as an investor and advisor in distressed debt, M&A, and restructuring at Angelo Gordon & Co. and Green Hill & Co. He holds a BA in economics from Princeton. Thank you all for joining us today. As a reminder, please enter your questions in the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen and vote on your favorite questions. We'll try to cover these at the end of each session. Without further ado, I'll pass it off to Natalie to moderate the discussion. Great. Thanks so much for the introductions, Elizabeth. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today to kick off the discussion on the plant-based CPG industry. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I currently work at Purple Carrot, um, which for those of you who don't know, um, Purple Carrot is a plant-based milk kit delivery company based here in the Boston area. Um, I joined Purple Carrot in early February to start the Garden Incubator, which invests capital and leverages the resources within Purple Carrot to support the growth of early stage plant-based brands. Um, Cessna and Dan, did you guys want to introduce yourselves quick before we start? Okay. Go ahead. All right. I'm very excited to be here, too. I, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, recently graduated from business school last May and joined Power Plant Ventures in, uh, at the end of last summer. Power Plant Ventures is a growth equity firm that invests in plant-centric food and beverage, food service, and food tech companies. We play in the emerging growth space, so looking to invest in companies typically making at least $5 million in revenue. Uh, we're pretty active investors. All of our partners have been founders and operators before. So Mark Rampola is the founder of Zico Coconut Water. Dan Gluck co-founded Health Warrior Chia Seed Bar. And TK Pillen, uh, TK Pillen and Kevin Boyling co-founded Veggie Grill, which is the last, largest vegan fast casual food chain in the U.S. Um, I am on the investment team and we do everything from deal sourcing, deal negotiations and uh, portfolio support on the back end. So really excited to be here today, um, excited to learn from our panelists as well and excited to answer your questions. And I'm Dan, I'm also very excited to be here. I'm the uh, co-founder of We Are The New Farmers. We are the next generation urban farm growing one of the most sustainable and nutrient dense foods that our planet has to offer. It's microalgae called spirulina. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard of spirulina, but it's basically a much smaller cousin of algae like seaweed and kelp uh, that happens to be packed with protein, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and really in our opinion has the potential to be the building block of the meal of the future. Um, before starting that, I worked as an investor as Elizabeth mentioned, um, it mostly in large grocery store chains, and that's how I became introduced to food. So I got uh, got to know some of the issues with the supply chains of our large grocery stores, especially as a New Yorker here in New York City, um, learning some of the realities about where our food comes from kind of spurred me to be inspired to start a company that tried to solve some of those issues. So also very excited to have this conversation. Awesome. All right, well, let's dive in here. Um, so our first question. Um, with the increasing interest in human health, sustainability, and the overall rise in plant-based diets, there are loads of opportunities to disrupt the conventional CPG industry. What do you think the biggest opportunities are for brands, and what role do you think startups and investors will play? Cessna, you want to kick things off? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity here. I think one of the largest is that consumers are listening. Given the current macro environment, they they want to learn more about what they're putting into their bodies, where it's coming from. So, you know, I think brands right now have the opportunity to help educate consumers and give them a simple message to talk about their health, sustainability, what plant-based diets really mean for them. And as investors in this space, you know, we, we and at Power Plant, we're looking to find, fund, help fuel and grow um, companies led by visionary entrepreneurs that are looking to re-architect our food system so that we can make the world a happier, healthier, more sustainable and ethical place. And I think that, you know, I think that those are pillars that most people would, would stand behind, at least one or the other. And I think right now there's a bigger push uh, behind it. And so I think there's a lot of exciting opportunity here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited by what's happening as well. Um, let me know if there are any issues with you guys hearing me. I thought someone commented on that. But um, I, think, I think we're getting to a place where there's another generation now of, of plant-based products that are coming onto the market, a bit of a more sophisticated place, of, um, set of products that are coming to the market. Um, and I'm really excited by those, not just plant-based, but also plant-based and better for you products. Um, and I think it's, I think that's really been spurred by consumers, like Sesnet said. I mean, people, the way people scrutinize labels of products now is um, so much more sophisticated than it was even five years ago. People don't just think about calories, carbs, protein. They're thinking about added sugar. They're looking at the actual list of ingredients and thinking, do I recognize all of these ingredients? Are they whole foods? Do I understand what this means? Are there as few ingredients as possible in the product? Um, so I'm, I'm really excited by that. And outside of that, I think um, food as medicine is a really exciting trend that we're starting to see become more and more popular. Um, people are realizing that you know heart disease or early onset dementia or a whole host of physical and neurological issues um, oftentimes can be mitigated by healthy eating. And the way people are using foods in particular in the, the fungi or fungi world and uh, the algae world, um, I think it's really, really exciting. And foods like uh, lion's mane or cordyceps or uh, even psilocybin, although I don't want to go down the psychedelic path on this conversation, but I think those are really interesting categories that are just becoming more and more popular. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think um, something I'm really excited about is, um, you know, biodiversity. I think, you know, it's 75% or 80% of our food comes from, you know, 12 plants and, and five animals. And so I think there's a huge opportunity to think about, you know, ways to incorporate different types of plant proteins or, um, you know, create products from, from different inputs. Um, you know, biodiversity is kind of at the intersection of sustainability and taste. And, you know, I think um, consumers are, you know, going to be looking for, you know, new innovative foods that, you know, with more biodiverse inputs, they can, you know, potentially be, you know, more nutritious, more interesting, um, and that also, you know, help the planet and provide opportunities for brands to really differentiate themselves from the competition. Um, let's see here. All right. So um, how would you say traditional CPG brands have responded to the shifts in consumer demands and how have your respective organizations responded to these shifts? Dan, you want to start that one? <laughs> oh, well, I don't think we can hear you right now. Uh -oh. I think you're. Uh oh. Oh, that's not. Can you hear me now? Okay, there we go. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, for yeah. some reason I went out. Um, <laughs> like we so, were doing so well. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, bound to be technical issues like this, but um, <laughs> so I'm. Uh, yeah, I, I think traditional CBG is catching up a little bit. I think they're moving a little bit slowly. Usually, you're seeing they're they're um, doing sort of copycat products. So you know they'll see a plant based burger. They'll come out with a plant-based burger, things like that. Um, but they know what's happening. They know that better for you and plant-based is really important. And they're um, focusing on those products internally. They're also, it's been interesting to see the larger CPG and food companies that are starting their own incubators where they're um, taking stakes in early stage companies that are working on these problems. I always draw the parallel between 
um, food and the pharma industry. I think big food kind of thinks of themselves as pharma companies now where they'll let startups go out there, do all the product R&D, do the customer discovery, come up with a brand and then, you know, pay a healthy multiple to acquire those companies and just fit them into their distribution and supply chain. Um, so you see a lot of that. Um, but I, I mean, generally they're catching up. I don't know what you think, that's not, but. Yeah, no, I, I echo all of what you said. I think that, you know, they, traditional CPG is known for the products that they have built over decades. Um, and they are really looking they, they know what the trends are. They keep a pulse on consumers and know that demands are, are evolving. And uh, they, I think, at their own pace, as you said, are developing on their own as well and creating some more better for you options based on what consumers are looking for, but are really looking to, um, or like startups and to uh, brands to really push forward and do the research to, to build something great out of what, um, what they're seeing. And I think that other ways in which they responded and or at least have been listening to is that I do think that, you know, it's up to the brands to really help create some more table stake um, attributes to their products, whether it's like more sustainable packaging or, you know, cleaner ingredients. And and I think strategics are looking for that, too. And as you said, when when the brands have done the work, that's when they you know, kind of consider coming in and learning from or acquiring yeah. these brands as well. Yeah, and also just so what what consumers are demanding is shifting so much. Um, and if if these guys don't change, um, I think they're just going to start losing shelf space. And the retailers are smart enough to see where people are heading. I think so. Um, they they sort of need to adjust. Mm -hmm. Um, longer term, um, you know, what is the role that you see the plant-based CPG sector playing kind of in the future of food broadly and um, <clears throat> what obstacles will be the most critical to overcome in order for the in industry to advance? Are we doing a back and forth thing? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, no, I think, um, I, I think long term, the biggest role for for food companies is consumer education. I think, a lot, as I mentioned earlier, I think consumers are listening now. They're asking more questions, becoming a lot more knowledgeable about you know what goes into their body and what they're consuming. And so, I think that the the biggest obstacle for a lot of these brands is it it is becoming a more crowded space right now. There are lots of incredible products, as you said, leveraging the diversity, the biodiversity of ingredients that we have and. I think consumers are excited about it, but they also want to know and want to be able to trust that whatever they're consuming or whatever they're choosing for themselves is is a right is a, is the right choice or is a choice that they know is not wrong at least at least at, to the way that um, and I think the opportunity there is for the brands to help kind of define that for consumers and help them learn and and respond to all these questions that they're asking. Um, you know, we had. I think you know, I think a lot of people, and especially in the natural space, um, CBD was a large you know, new category that people had so many questions on, called the wild wild west. And you know, there's tons of regulation that is still a, pretty ambiguous as to what what is okay, what is not. So I think that's like a very clear example of as as products continue to evolve um, and create more out of the ingredients we have on this on this planet, then. Um, it's it's there's going to be a lot more research uh, and more explanation around what these products are and why are they why are they good for you why are they not bad for you why are they healthier or not? Yeah, I think in a weird way you have a lot of the same issues that existed for uh, CBD or now now food. I mean, it's it's easy to greenwash your products or to make claims that aren't necessarily true. Or, um, you know, it's hard to parse through what's actually good for you at the end of the day in such a crowded world, which is why I think innovation in CBG in a lot of ways is heading towards um, as much transparency and traceability as possible and authenticity. Um, I think to be an innovative CBG brand today, you need to you need to explain, you know, where your ingredients come from. How are they processed? How do you ensure that they're safe? I can't believe we haven't mentioned coronavirus up until this point, but like more so than ever, 
um, <laughs> that those are issues that I think people are thinking about right now. Um, and I think it's a great time to innovate as a company. You know, pandemics and recessions are times when uh, traditional brands may not be innovating quite as much. So I think startups have um, the opportunity to really speak to consumers because consumers are definitely listening. Um, and authenticity really helps there. But uh, I think it'll be interesting to see what what companies are born out of this in six months, nine months, or a year. I'm, I'm excited to see that. But. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at the plant-based CPG industry kind of a, you know, kind of like an agent for change across several different areas, right? I mean, you know, first and foremost, of course, it's a, a solution to industrial animal agriculture, um, but there's also great opportunities to address, you know, other issues like food waste, for example. Um, there's some really awesome startups right now using upcycled ingredients, um, and, you know, soil health is another one, right? Um regenerative agriculture. Um, the plant-based CPG industry is kind of has it tent has its tentacles in a lot of, you know, really important areas. And I think um, it's inherently very tied, you know, to the planet. Um, and so I think it's really exciting to see kind of the impact it can have um, kind of broadly across a lot of really important areas. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, What what about, um, which companies um, in the future of CPG are you most excited about? Is there a particular, you know, sector or area kind of within plant-based? Um, you know, what gets you most excited these days? I'll Dan? start, I guess. Uh, like I said, food, I think food as, med as medicine is um, very interesting. And, you know, almost food as a sort of immunity, um, especially mm -hmm. today, but also going forward is just going to increase in popularity. Um, I'm also, just given my background, very interested in, um, how we now that we've centralized food production over the last 100 years, how we then start to think about resilience and, and decentralization almost, um, sort of in some ways similar to what happened to the way that we get electricity from the power grid in the United States, how now decentralized and resilient electricity supply um, is, is more important than ever. And I think that's happening in food too. And the pandemic has just exacerbated all the problems that existed in logistics within food and transportation of food. Um, so I'm really intrigued by that, uh, I would say. Um, yeah, and, and, and lowering the number of miles that food travels to me is, is extremely important. Um, I, you know, when I was naive and a fresh-faced recent college graduate and I started working with uh, these grocery store chains and I learned that, like you said, food waste is such a big issue for them that they have a specific line item that's a huge line item on their P&L called shrink, which is just accounting mm -hmm. for food waste, um, solving those issues on uh, how we get our food, how we store our food, and uh, where how food ends up on our actual plates, I think is just, um, just going to be more important in the future. Yeah, I... I agree. I think that that movement towards, you know, the focus on sustainability and and transparency of supply chain and manufacturing is is uh, a huge bright side for especially the push of this current environment. Um, outside of that, I think, you know, from the consumer angle, I, what I'm most excited about for the future of CPG and how these brands are, you know, shaping their their brand promises and what they're offering is that they they are looking to help make personal health and the health of the planet an easier choice. Um, and so, you know, again, with going back to how crowded the space is and how much consumers want to know and want to learn about what they're doing, um, but they also are looking for, you know, trusted platforms, brands that are authentic and clear and transparent about what they're, what they're providing or what they're trying to do at least. Um, and, you know, I think consumers are looking for go-to platform, go-to brands um, that they can trust. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the simpler the message is and it can be around that, the easier it is to bring more people on board, to make it more accessible, um, to, to make these options that are, are better for you personally and better for the planet. Definitely. Um, what have been some of the greatest challenges your companies have faced um, bringing innovative CPG brands to market and scaling? We talked about it a bit before, but education is a huge hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, 
for sure. And, you know, especially with novel products, um, it's how do you, how do you get people to use those products? How do you change consumer behavior? It's always a challenge. I think it's been really interesting to see how successful the beyond meets of the world have been, um, essentially just, you know, tagging on to a use case that everyone understands like a burger, um, and trying to innovate through a simple use case. Um, versus trying to change consumer behavior entirely. Um, I think that's that's a good way to do it, but also um, getting people to care about sustainability and uh, making that an actual purchasing decision is a challenge. I think I think it's a I think it's nice to have for a lot of people. I don't think it's one of the most important um, purchasing factors for most people, um, but that is changing over time. I'm um, curious to hear what you think on this, though, Sosna. Yeah, no, I think that, as you said, I, I think that environmental sustainability is, is increasingly important, but as we've kind of discussed before, but uh, it, it, I think generally in the food and beverage space, uh, there's a bit of a hierarchy between first taste and, you know, really fitting in with what consumers love and understand, like the burger. Um, and then there's, you know, the tier of price. I think that's another major challenge in this space, because, especially in the plant-based world, because a lot of our manufacturing and supply chains aren't necessarily optimized yet for bringing on board all of these new products, sourcing them, farming them. Um, and so I think that's an, another major challenge. And I think for brands specifically, given that the space is increasingly crowded, um, you know, finding a differentiated value proposition that really resonates with consumers. I think it's a lot of the brands are, you know, there are traditional CPG that everyone loves, but in general, those choices are still very personal. And I think when we come down to, you know, I, I love the trend that you spoke about earlier and that food is medicine, you know, medicine is also very personal. Um, and so how do you know that you're making the right choice for you on that day um, in, in the environment that you're in, it, at the price that you can afford? Um, so I think these are some of the, the major challenges that I'm seeing a lot of innovation around and I'm really excited about, but it, it, I think there's still a long way to go. What do you think about distribution challenges? I, I, I'm asking the question because I think some of the direct to consumer luster has sort of worn off over the last year or two. Um, and meanwhile, it's still as hard as ever to get onto a retail shelf and as crowded as ever. So how do you actually get in front of a consumer? And I don't know what you're seeing your company doing that's working these days. I mean, I mean, you know, a lot of brands are really kind of circumventing retail altogether and just going, you know, straight to the consumer. So there's been a huge uptick in DTC brands, many of which have been incredibly successful because they're able to, you know, build a connection with the consumer um, at much lower cost than, you know, paying slotting fees and getting up on shelf. Um, and, you know, with the rise of e-commerce, especially after COVID, um, I think that's going to be a really smart way for these brands to start because it is expensive to go straight to retail and especially in, you know, particular categories like frozen, for example, it's, you know, the fees are really high. And for these small brands, it's, it's tough to compete with the, with the large legacy brands who kind of have all the shelf space and can afford to, you know, pay, pay the additional fees. So, yeah. um, in terms of distribution, I think a lot of them have been just kind of starting out online first. Um, but yes, let's know what, what's been your take. Yeah, I think it's been interesting because our portfolio consists of some D2C brands like Purely Native and online. And, you know, they have that direct consumer link or link to their consumers they can engage with and message and learn from. Um, I think a lot of our brands who are on who are CPG typically use re, that use retail as their main channel. They're also learning. They're trying to evolve rapidly and trying to develop this direct line to consumers to get it out. But yeah, that, yeah. those you know processes are are still um, still new for them. Um, and so I think you know a lot of our I think generally and maybe this is a little off topic from our the question you asked, but you know. A lot of our brands, actually a little more detailed, but, um, you know, they go through large distributors and then there's like that step in the process. And those distributors were overwhelmed with, you know, trying, especially in this environment, for example, overwhelmed with trying to make sure they got essential items out. And so our brands really had to push either that they were considered essential or, you know, to make sure that their distributors stayed on top of merchandising and making sure that they didn't have stockouts and ordering on time. And so I think it, I think that that layer is removed if you do go D to C, but, uh, you know, it is a new muscle to flex for them. Definitely. 
Um, so listen, do you think from the investor perspective, um, just kind of given the new environment and the the you know prevalence of e-commerce kind of more so than ever, um, do you think that that's going to be a factor that you're really going to consider when you look at brands in terms of, you know, what's what's their infrastructure? How, how you know, what's their connection to the consumer from kind of a social standpoint and all that? Is that going to be weighted heavier now? Uh, yeah, personally, I, I do think so. I think it's going to be a reality that consume. I mean, it already is a reality that consumers are shopping more online. And I do think that's going to be a sustained trend, maybe not necessarily at the at the same levels right away. But I, I do think that's going to be more of the norm. And I think that brands are going to need to understand that space. I think strategics are going to want brands to understand that space. And but I still think that brands need to make a deliberate and whatever they're choosing to do, it is a deliberate choice because they are very different strategies. And I think it's 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 hard to tell right now how retail will what it will look like um, right. even yeah. in the next month, maybe even just a few weeks. So um, I, I think that how I'll be looking at brands is how self how self aware are they in terms of what they know and what they don't know and what are they putting in place to mitigate these risks um, mm -hmm. all the things that they don't know and um, and so uh, but I, again I do think that um, a lot of consumers are are discovering brands through online and and at, with the ease of you know messaging and being able to educate consumers that way about what is your product, what is your value proposition, that's gonna be even more important. Definitely. So Dan, this question is for you. Um, what challenges have you encountered when raising capital and what have you learned uh, through that experience? Good and bad. <laughs> um, well, I wish I had all the answers to this question. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, we're a food production business. We're um, essentially an indoor farming business, but we also are trying to commercialize a CBG product that is in sort of a new space. And um, the challenge of explaining that to investors and getting over the hurdle of, um, yeah, there are capital costs up front. We are a capital intensive business, but, you know, those might not be as significant as you probably think. And even though we are owning production, um, we can still succeed with a packaged good um, is a huge issue. I mean, investors oftentimes want you to, want you to focus on one or the other. Um, but I, I really think personally that uh, owning production, whether you literally own it and are doing the manufacturing or um, being closely involved throughout the entire production process if on the other side of the spectrum, is just going to be absolutely key going forward for food businesses. And is a really good way to stand out. Um, because it gives you, again, that authenticity, that transparency, uh, the knowledge of what you're actually selling to people and where it comes from. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's explaining, explaining what we're trying to do um, and, and, you know, getting the sustainability message in there, too, and finding investors who are aligned with that and who care about that, who don't, um, who don't just think about, you know, uh, exit potential necessarily, even though that's obviously hugely important. Uh, but one thing that we are seeing more and more often with investors that we're meeting with is that, um, especially now, a path to profitability is pretty mm -hmm. important. Um, and, you know, through the years of just being able to go be six, seven, eight years into a venture without any any real realistic shot of profitability, I don't think is um, a good way to go about fundraising anymore. So I think you need to have a clear path to profitability. So what do, you think? do you agree with that point? I, yeah, I, I agree with you on a lot of those points. Um, yeah. You know, with even with our companies, when the environment really hit the U.S. or this COVID environment really hit the U.S., we we with our portfolio companies kind of went on lockdown mode and and really encouraged them to think like we don't know what the world is going to look like. Recession is impending or happening right now. So balance sheet strength is was more important than ever. Are you managing your cash burn? And when we look to new investments as well, you know, it is a lot more cautious these days. We have plenty these days, we have plenty of capital to deploy, but the bar is a lot higher because you know multiples are going down. Businesses that are burning a lot of cash to online either acquire consumers or via trade spend, you know, no one's shopping uh, and looking at these promotions and in, in the same way, at least anymore. And so, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. We definitely encourage our companies to 
you know, growth is important, absolutely. Um, but making sure you have a sustainable business model is is going to you you need to be able to survive these times. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or as as we all learn, like what does the new normal look like? Yeah, and as a founder, you need to be raising for eighteen to twenty four months in this kind of yeah. environment. You can't. It can't be the nine to twelve months that maybe it was right. a couple of years ago. Yeah. Dan, have you found it hard to find um, investors that, I mean, your space is fairly new, um, I think even to people kind of in the food space. Um, how do you approach kind of finding investors that would kind of understand your business model, understand your supply chain and your production process and who can appreciate that given how um, important it is to your to, to your company? Yeah, it's, it's definitely difficult with people who have no experience with agriculture technology um, yeah. or, or real food production because uh, it's just they get too frightened by the concept of that immediately um, versus just working with a co-packer and, and mm -hmm. having a nice brand and rolling that out. But um, so, you know, people who have experience with similar types of businesses is definitely important. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, Cessna, this question is for you. Um, how do you typically evaluate innovative CPG companies? Do you have any advice for uh, brands that are trying to raise capital now during the pandemic? and then also for when it subsides? Yeah, so I'll, I can speak to the first question of how we typically evaluate, and especially like pre-COVID and then how maybe that's changed a little now. But um, yeah, I, I think as investors in CPG, we look at the same typical metrics. So, you know, revenue, what is your growth been? What do your margins look like? What are your velocities in store if you're selling in retail? So, you know, are you turning, are you, and that's a proof point for consumer interest and, you know, like, or demand for your product. Um, and then being in what, in the emerging growth space, you know, we, we know that there are some startup costs. And so, but we really look to the team. Um, do we believe that they, they can exit? execute on what is their plan and do we believe that they have the right team on board to execute their product again being food and beverage what what does it taste like do we do we like the product mm -hmm. um and and then obviously um being plant-centric or plant-based investors we're looking at the team as well are you really trying to solve a problem here um there's an we have an impact focus as well so one of our diligence questions is you know do you know your supply chain like if we ask you like do you and it's gonna be open-ended so like do you know your supply chain and the level of depth that we get in terms of responses really helps to highlight like how how mission driven are you and 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 we believe that that is something that consumers care about and will continue to care about and not only that but you know we believe that is better for the planet as well so um you know, gain, understanding that has been an important part of who we hope to have as part of the power plant family. And um, and then, you know, especially now and during these uncertain times with founders raising, as I mentioned before, balance sheet strength, are you really building a sustainable business model where you don't continue to need like hundreds or millions of dollars to sustain yourself for the next few months before you kind of show that you can reach those margins? Um, I think the other thing, especially in this innovative space and in the plant-based world is um, we, and you know, a lot of what happened with Beyond Meat. And I think a lot of our companies uh, really use that as a, as an, or Beyond Meat and Impossible as, as our stars as to what is the potential here? Because I think, you know, they, they are a food unicorn. Um, and, and I think it's a, a really, important ambition, um, but, you know, Beyond Meat really just grew the category and the market size for plant-based eaters. And they weren't just competing against other vegetarian, vegan options. They really made this accessible for people who didn't consider themselves that. And so you saw this big movement between not being called just vegan or vegetarian, though I think some of those labels are important as consumers just want to something quick and simple to trust and learn from, but also making it not as confining to a definition of like, oh, I'm a vegan. Um, no, I just want to make choices. Yeah. So um, I think I think when we look at companies in this space, I think you know, there's a, for example, in like the alternative cheese space, um, 
that I think that's been a big sticking point for for people in the plant based world. And are you are you competing amongst the other plant based cheeses on the market? Are you really creating a product that tastes as well, that melts as well, um, that you know non vegan or vegetarian eaters would be excited to eat as well? Um, yeah, that's that's the question now is really you know who's driving the plant based movement is flexitarian. That's not not really the vegetarians and vegans. I mean, they inherently will have lower expectations, I think, for things because they have you know other drivers and other reasons. You know, it's a good mm -hmm. thing, right? I mean, they're they don't expect it to taste exactly like the real thing, but you know, people who eat meat do, and um, you know, so that's that's obviously a constant battle is trying to get that taste and texture just right. Um, you know, they've done done it really well in the milk category and, and beef has come a very long way. But, um, you know, chicken is is innovating, but that still has a, you know quite a bit of a ways to go. And so, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's evolving <laughs> constantly. Cool. And I think the second part of your question, I, I think I might have missed it. But um, the advice for companies that are fundraising right now, I, I, I do want to echo, Dan, I think right now for entrepreneurs, it's really tough. It's a really tough time, but to the extent that you can raise now, then you know, look to raise a little bit more through the next 18 months at least, uh, as you kind of uh, try to survive these times and and to make sure that the business is sustainable. Um, I think that it's challenging for sure, but um, if it's possible, then that's a good way to go. Agreed. Definitely. Are there any particular um, you know, categories or attributes that you find most attractive right now that would kind of, you know, make you more willing to invest during kind of uncertain times? Um, I think, I think as we talked about before, more of a path to profitability, the sooner you can get there, the better. Um, and, and that's something that is pretty challenging right now. And also just being strategic about your cash burn. So, you know, as retailers are, as uh, shopping traffic at retail has slowed down, like, are you still spending as much on promotions, things like that? Or are you looking, or have you been making some investments in e -com? Not necessarily that you should, but are you being smart about the way you're spending is, is mm -hmm. definitely a deeper question to probe. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of dovetails into the next question here, which is, you know, COVID has obviously altered demand um, for and, and purchasing of CPG goods. You know, how are you changing your strategy? Usually for us, I mean, we, we had a uh, restaurant business that obviously is almost non-existent now, but fortunately that wasn't a huge part of our business, but we're focusing on direct to consumer, um, focusing on profitable sales and profitable customer acquisition um, right now. We are, have been fortunate, I think, in that people are flocking towards local, um, safe food where that especially immune boosting products and, and mm -hmm. fresh spirulina definitely falls in that category. So we've been growing over 50% every month since, since this has started, which has been great. But um, just being a little bit more careful with where we're spending cash and uh, being as honest as possible with consumers. Like the, with what, the more that we, on our social channels or in our messaging we'll talk about where we're struggling what we're trying to fix how we're dealing with our problems during corona during coronavirus we see immediate upticks in sales the, the, like right when we become as honest as possible so we're, we're just being really honest with people we're trying to continue operating we're we've reduced our um man hours at the at our facility by 85 percent. so really we're only operating down there two days a week and the rest is remote um, to try and keep everything as safe as possible. So it, it's been challenging, but I think, um, you know, it's, I think it's proving how resilient some of these food businesses can become. Yeah. And finding yeah. ways with consumers is, is super important. So that's great yeah. to hear that you're seeing, you're seeing that come through. Sorry, yeah. Cessna, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I, I agree with that. I think our, I think in terms of demand and purchasing habits, kind of similarly, we have a number of our, uh, companies in the immunity space. So Vive Organic Wellness Shots is, is an immunity oh, boosting oh. shot. So they, they're, oh, oh. you know, cons there's a lot of consumer demand for those types of products. And, you know, for us, I think we also noticed there has been, our companies have been um, trying to be 
are trying to communicate as much as they can without overwhelming consumers, but making sure that the message is clear, they're doing everything they can to protect the health and safety of their consumers, but also of their employees, um, because it, it, you know, we, we're all part of the ecosystem here. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I do think, you know, other things that we've seen is, you know, are, as mentioned earlier, how our brands are looking to other channels to reach consumers and, you know, they've been, whereas, you know, innovation use is a big driver for growth. Typically, right now, that's not necessarily the focus as opposed to making sure consumer, existing consumers can still get the products that they know and love, and you still keep them engaged while also looking to um, and support new avenues for growth as well. So, you know, we saw February and March as initial pantry stockpiling of uh, mm. staple goods of their favorites, um, usually self shelf stable items. And and now, you know, we're in now that it's April and move, or I guess it's May now, but um, moving more into that, starting to see um, where consumers are, start, are shopping, how they're getting their products, what are they looking for now? Right. All right, um, we're going to take some questions from the audience now. Yeah, Elizabeth. Sure. Um, here's a question from Ian Lopez. Where in the world or in the U.S. do you see rapid successful adoption of new plant-based innovation? And what factors do you think are the highest drivers of behavior change towards plant-based? Really good question. Um, lately, I've been seeing, or maybe just maybe just been listening to, um, a lot of innovation in Asia, um, in Latin as well. But you know, in the alternative protein space specifically, I think that there's been a lot of innovation. So Shiok Meats is a startup that's based in Singapore, looking to um, uh, develop uh, a plant-based or cell-based uh, seafood, um, and I think. Well, I think that there are drivers by the country. So Singapore, it is a large focus for the country itself. Um, I think other factors is just the health crises that have that these countries have encountered really, you know, ha shedding light on the importance of supply chain transparency, where is food coming from? So I, I've, I've noticed a, an uptick at least, and I'm sure these companies have been in, or these countries have been innovating for many years, just I'm seeing it a lot more in terms of the news in the US. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Purple Carrot's actually a perfect example. So Purple Carrot was acquired by um, Oli6 Radici last year, about a year, um, almost a year ago, exactly. Um, so, and they're a Japanese, a public company in Japan. Um, and, you know, they wanted to, you know, expand their presence in, in the U.S., but also um, address this growing um, demand for plant-based eating um, in Japan. So, um, yeah, it's definitely happening over in Asia for sure. Yeah. Great. Um, there are a few questions about deal sourcing. Um, maybe Cessna and... Um, Natalie, this can be directed towards you. How do you find out about new trends in the industry or innovative companies? Yeah, take this first. Yes, yeah, go ahead. You start. Oh, I said, do you want to take it first? For deal sourcing, um, you know, it's staying super connected to the industry itself and leveraging your network is super important. I mean. Pretty much every deal, you know, especially when I was working at Whipstitch, you know, was coming in through someone within our network. Um, and you know, even even now, when I get introduced to companies, it's always through someone that I know. So, and also making sure that you return that favor, and so then people are more inclined to do it for you. And it, it you know, it's really just leveraging your network and investing in that, um, and then attending, you know, or virtually um, like this. Um, you know, keeping a pulse on, these are great for kind of getting updates on trends and, and hearing kind of what people are thinking in the industry. So I was going to say, you know, going to conferences and whatnot, but, um, you know, those will still happen just kind of in, in a different format. Um, and then reading and, you know, I, I'm big into macro trends. I think those are going to be, you know, shaping the future of a lot of things, but um, CPG uh, most certainly over the next, um, definitely over the next decade for sure. Um, 
So yeah, and yeah, that's that's kind of how I think about it. So that's not anything to add. Now, similarly, I think, you know, I uh, at Power Plant, as all of our partners have been in this space for decades, from when I initially joined Power Plant, deal sourcing was not necessarily something I had to do myself because it was a lot more of managing inbound because of this large network that had been established already. And especially now that I've been here a few months, you know, most of the deals that I come across are from the network that I've built myself as well. Um, I And again, I think attending conferences is a great way for discovery and being proactive about it and staying on top of on of these trends and you know following newsletters and things like that i i think uh, bevna and nosh i've just been getting a lot of really great insights from from them and um learning not only from the newsletters but from the the people in the network itself for just coming across new exciting companies and brands so um it's a lot of what natalie said as well well last, last thing i'll mention is, um attending picture of um, I, I live in Boston, so, you know, fortunate to be able to go to, um, you know, events at, you know, Harvard and MIT and all the universities in the city. Um, those are great ways to discover new brands, um, companies that I've never heard of, you know, that are incredible. Um, so even just kind of keeping a pulse on your, the local universities um, and, and the pitch events that they're having with their kind of entrepreneurial networks um, are a great thing to tap and kind of um, keep a pulse on as well. Actually, and I also forgot my favorite way of sourcing, which is, <laughs> Not necessarily always the most fruitful, but it's the most fun is just going to grocery stores. And yeah. you know, I think the best part about being in the food and beverage space is that you, you you can have your own opinion as a consumer. You can see what attracts your eye. You can taste it yourself. So, um, yeah, it, it was a personal childhood, like favorite pastime and it still is. So <laughs> highly encourage anyone to do that. Definitely. Uh, Natalie, thank you so much for your time. This was amazing. Um, we're you. We're overdue for the next panel, so uh, thanks everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. Be safe. Bye.